There you go. So welcome everybody to today's session on the FDS system training. I'm Kate, I'm joined by Melinda Funk, and let's get started. Now, oops, let's, hang on, I need to fix my, my view screen, just a moment. There we go, all right, so now I can see your chat. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to give you a basic overview of a lot of different information. So first of all, uh, we're going to start with talking about uh, all of the various different parts of managing your FDS filers. So uh, for part one and two, we're gonna start the same way. I'm gonna start with just a basic overview of the information in that section. And then from there, I'm going to talk about key tasks that are uh, placed upon ethics officers about managing that part of the program. And then I close each section with a, an FAQ. Uh, we, we know the kinds of common questions that people have with, the, uh, with using the FDS system. So we put together an FAQ section to help answer some of your questions. So one of the things that I would say is, by all means, use the text chat area uh, as, as questions occur to you but I'm probably going to be waiting on most questions until after I get through the FAQ part because we think we anticipate many of the questions that you may ask. So um, you might wanna just hold off on your questions until we get to the end of the FAQ and if I didn't answer your question then, I'll give you an opportunity to, to post. But I know some people are slow typers, so if you wanna just type up your questions in advance, that's fine, we'll figure that out. So we'll do that for filers and for ethics training. And then the third part of the program is I will give you a whirlwind tour of the FDS system. So I'll go through all of the different menus and show you what functions are available in the system and uh, sure, uh, give you some advice on troubleshooting some issues that you may find as, as they come up. So let's start with the financial disclosure overview. Now, first of all, we all use acronyms here in the state, and so the financial disclosure statement is shortened to FDS, and employees who are required to file financial disclosure statements are called FDS filers. So uh, I will be using FDS and FDS filers throughout today's training to refer to those folks. So the FDS is a publicly available document that contains all sorts of financial and professional information about both the filer and their spouse. Now the purpose of the financial disclosure form is transparency, mainly. Uh, as public employees, as public servants, we are accountable to the public. So the financial disclosure statement is a primary means by which the public can ensure that these state employees are acting in the public's best interest and not in their own self-interest. So it's all about trying to prevent conflicts of interest between uh, an employee's personal private life and their public duties. That's, what, that, that's the, the whole rationale for, for filing financial disclosure forms. Now, who is required to file these forms? Um, first of all, there are over 30,000 uh, filers statewide. So it's a very large population of people that have to file these on an annual basis. But generally speaking, your filers most likely fall into one of two categories. Either they are, uh, they are persons that your agency has designated as policymakers. So these are employees who are, fill, uh, who are filling job titles that your agency has, has delegated as, as policymaker. That's an agency level decision and not a JCOP decision. You tell us who your policymakers are, not the other way around. Right? The other criteria that would make somebody uh, required to file an FDS is their salary. So if their salary exceeds a certain threshold, that also triggers the criteria that they have to uh, file an annual FDS. Now the, the, the threshold for their salary is pinned to the CSCA salary grade 24. And, and that's true whether or not they belong to a union at all. It's just that we needed a benchmark to pin the salary threshold to, and that's what it gets, gets pinned to. So, Another important thing to know, because sometimes new filers really get confused about this, is that the financial disclosure form is a backward-looking document. 
which means that it, you're always reporting data for the previous year. And so for a brand new filer, uh, the filer is going to be asked to file a financial disclosure form for the previous year, even though they weren't a filer that previous year, but that's just the way the, the, the form goes. So um, just understanding that can help you answer some questions from your new employees who, uh, who become filers. Now, the filing threshold, as I said, is pinned to CSEA's salary grade 24, and that usually changes from year to year. We're in kind of a, a special situation this year in that uh, CSEA has not yet negotiated their new contract. Their, their contract ended uh, this past year, and they were supposed to negotiate a new contract, but, you know, it's been a busy year for a lot of people in a lot of ways, maybe. So they haven't done that yet. So we presume that those contract negotiations are happening. We presume that there will be a new salary schedule at some point. But we don't yet know if the new salary schedule will be made retroactive. So the impact on threshold filers is currently unknown. But we will let you know. When we know, we will let you know. So for the time being, the salary threshold remains where it was last year, which is 101.379. And as I said, once, once something changes in that direction, we will, by all means, uh, provide you with notice of uh, what those changes uh, mean as far as impacts on your filers. Sometimes people ask uh, when they have a new employee, is, uh, is a part-time employee required to file a financial disclosure form? And, and that is a maybe, because it kind of depends. If they're in a part-time position that was designed to be part-time and their salary is never going to exceed the salary threshold, then no, they're not required to file. But if it is a if it really is a full-time position with a salary that would exceed that threshold and the filer is electing to work less hours in order to stay below the threshold, then yes, they would still be required to file. So if you ever have any questions about that kind of thing, uh, give the FDS unit a call and they can uh, help you sort that out. I did not give a disclaimer that I think is, is, is worthwhile. I'm going to talk a lot. I'm going to talk fast. I've got a lot of material to cover, um, and I just hope that you can bear with me on that. Um, use the text chat area. If I go too fast or if I skip over something that's important to you, uh, by all means flag me down in text chat. But otherwise, buckle up because whew, here we go. All right, so filing deadlines. Filing deadlines depend on which category your filers are in. And there are two basic categories that have two completely different set of deadlines and due dates. So the two categories are academic filers and non-academic filers. The large majority of uh, employees or FDS filers are non-academic filers. This is your rank and file folks who are either policymakers or uh, threshold filers. And that their due date, uh, their filing deadline is May 15th. So it's one month after your taxes are due. So as I tell people in our regular trainings, if, if you're a non-academic filer, when your taxes are due in April, just leave your stack of financials there on your desk because in just a few weeks you'll have to file your financial disclosure forms. <clears throat> now, for academic filers, um, for, for academic filers, May 15th happens to land right in the middle of uh, final exams, graduation on college campuses. So academic filers are SUNY and CUNY professors, and because May 15th is right in a hot zone for their professional lives, they have a separate November 15th due date for filing. So academic filers are really specifically referencing faculty at SUNY and CUNY, but they will have, if you are the ethics officer of a SUNY or CUNY campus, just know that you may, in fact, have two separate groups of filers and two separate groups of deadlines in order to manage. So pay attention to that because I will be giving those two different sets of deadlines depending on what kind of uh, employees that you're dealing with. Um, also important to know, anytime a filing deadline falls on a weekend, it's automatically extended to the next business day. So if, um, like for this year, May 15th falls on a Saturday, 
So the filing due date will actually be May 17th because that's the first Monday after the filing deadline. So um, I've kept all of the dates here, what they actually are, but just know that if they land on a weekend, it'll always be the next Monday. All right, so for new filers, there is, there is some, uh, because of the way the FDS system manages some tasks behind the scenes, there are some technical de deadlines for new filers. The general rule of thumb is that a new filer has 30 days to file for the previous year. So when, when they first come on board, they join your agency, they're a brand new FDS filer, Generally speaking, they have 30 days to file for the previous year, but <clears throat> it does kind of depend in part on when their profile gets added to the system. For regular non-academic filers, if they get added between January and April, because it's close enough to their filing deadline, May 15th, they can wait until May 15th to file. But for the rest of the year, if they get added from April through December, that's the normal 30-day filing deadline. Academic filers, it's, it's a little bit different. If they get added between January and October, then they get um, a November 15th deadline. It's only if they get added to the system in those uh, the late fall months from October to December do they have that 30-day deadline. So um, if you ever have any questions when you're adding new filers about when their due date is, uh, just give us a call and we'll, we'll help you figure that out. Now, filers can request an extension of time to file, just like filing your taxes. Sometimes things come up and you can't get it done on time, and that's fine. But just like filing your taxes, uh, requesting an extension has to happen by the due date. You can't wait until you're already past due to request an extension. All right? So uh, extension requests are granted based on justifiable cause or undue hardship. So the filer has to give us some reason for the extension, and that gets considered. So just keep in mind that that extension, that deadline for an extension is the same as your due date, whether you're an academic or non-academic filer. Filers can request an extension themselves by just going into the FDS system. There's a button in the FDS filer section of the filer's profile that allows them to request an extension. But we also have a downloadable uh, paper application available on our website, so they can use that as well. There is also a mechanism by which some people can request an exemption from the filing requirement entirely. This uh, happens on a case-by-case -case basis, and please note it's only available for threshold filers. An exemption from filing is not available for policymakers. All policymakers must file an annual FDS as long as they remain a policymaker. So uh, exemptions from filing is only available for people who who have salary reasons, threshold reasons for filing. So they can uh, either request uh, a consideration for exemption, either through the FDS system, again, uh, on their profile, or there is an application on our website, or a, um, an ethics officer or a union rep can also request an exemption for a whole class or category of people. But we did just this year go through uh, a, a title exemption review project where all of the various job titles that have been granted an exemption since the dawn of time uh, were all reviewed and uh, some of those exemptions went away. Uh, a lot of the title list got cleared up. There was a lot of titles that don't even exist anymore. So um, if you have any questions about whether there's a, an exemption in place for a job title, please reach out to the FDS unit because uh, we did just recently do a lot of work this year kind of cleaning that up and making that more streamlined. Now, exemptions means that you don't have to, um, you don't have to file your annual FDS and you don't have to uh, attend ethics training. And those exemptions are in place basically for as long as nothing changes. So, if, if something changes significantly for the filer, either their job title changes or their job duties change, or if they become a policymaker, those are the kinds of things that would cause them to lose their exemption status. So just keep in mind that uh, it, is, it is required that ethics officers or their delegates 
uh, notify us via the FDS system anytime a, a significant change happens in the filer status so that we can help manage this kind of thing. All right, so there's the big overview of FDS filers and kind of big pieces. So now I'm going to look specifically at the key management tasks for these FDS filers. Now, um, I'm going to refer to, um, to your role as FDS officers. And what that means is either ethics officers or your delegated agency contacts. You're all considered um, management officers in the system, right, even, even agency contacts. So, uh, so if I refer to ethics officers here, what I'm really referring to is you two agency contacts um, these, are, these are tasks that are uh, required of the ethics officer, but the ethics officer can delegate them to agency contacts, so uh, they might be required of you. So let's talk about what it takes. There's a couple of key, uh, key actions that relate to managing FDS filers, and one of the most important is certification. Certification contains the name, title, home address, uh, an email address of each individual who is designated as an FDS filer. And once a year, the agency has to submit and certify to JCO a list of all active filers within their agency. Now, when you have to certify that list depends on whether we're dealing with academic filers or non-academic filers. So for non-academic filers, for the, for the large majority of people, that list needs to be certified to us by the end of February. Uh, our SUNY and CUNY professors, that, that list needs to get certified to us by September 30th. Now, that list is really important because that is the only way that we know who is either a policymaker or a threshold filer. So the agency needs to provide that to us on an annual basis so that we can implement the, the filing requirements. And so there's a lot of laws wrapped around those requirements. One of them is the requirement that ethics officers update filer information within 30 days of any significant change. So technically, anytime you update a filer, you are amending your certification. Uh, it's just the way the, the law is written. So if we talk about an amended certification, we're really just talking about filer updates in the system these days. <clears throat> also, uh, one of the key tasks is to notify filers of their obligations before you create a profile for them. There are some automated system notices that get sent to filers on creation of their profile, but you'll want to let them know that filing an FDS is a requirement of their job before you create a profile for them, because otherwise they get very confused, like, what is this that we're hearing? All right. So please notify individuals of their requirements to file and, and take ethics training before, uh, before you create that profile. Now, there are some important dates for ethics officers. Now, um, we should have sent you a copy of a handout called Important Dates for Ethics Officers. And that lists all of these dates, both um, non-academic and academic filers. So uh, if I'm going quickly through this, look for those handouts if you're looking for dates of, of what needs to happen. So you should have already received a, a notice that it is time to begin the review of your non-academic filer list. So the, because that gets sent out um, uh, first week of January, usually speaking, right? So this is the time where you, the ethics officers and agency contacts should be reviewing the list of all active filers in your agency. Some agencies have a lot of filers, and this is a big lift. Uh, if you're at an agency that has a small list of filers, maybe not such a big lift. But what you're looking for is um, verifying all of the information for all of the filers that you have, including their contact information and their salary information and, um, and their designation, and updating any information that may have been overlooked during the past year. All right, so this is your chance to really nail it down and make sure that what you submit to us is accurate. Now, the certification, as I said, for non-academic filers happens by the end of February. So you're going to be, uh, by, by the applicable date, so for academic filers, this is the end of September. So by 
one of those two dates, ethics officers and agency contacts, you have to have reviewed, updated, and certified your agency's list of active filers. And by submitting that certification, you're really vouching for the accuracy of the list, and you're agreeing to update any changes to that list as, uh, as they occur within 30 days of the date of change. The Commission really does rely absolutely on uh, this list in order to manage FDS compliance on our end. So, um, so please do pay close attention to this task. It really is very important. It really is the foundation of uh, the whole system. Now, notifications. Um, ethics officers are responsible for informing their filers uh, that they are required to file this annual FDS form. So please notify them in advance that their names have been reported to JCOPE and advise them of the financial disclosure filing requirements and the ethics training requirements before you create, uh, before you create a profile for them in the system. Um, so notify them uh, by March if they're going to be filers if, or by October if they're new filers or within 30 days of when they have to file. So basically it's just if you know you have a new staff member who's going to be an FDS filer, let them know up front that that's going to happen so that when, they, when you create a profile for them in the system and they start receiving these automated notices, it won't catch them by surprise because that's not a nice way to find out. Now, for the, uh, for the filing requirement, uh, we're going to send uh, an advance notice about a month before the filing requirement. We send a notice to all FDS filers letting them know that uh, your filing time, your filing window has opened. All right? So by April 15th for non-academics, by October 15th for academic filers. All right? um, if, uh, when, when a new filer is added to the system uh, outside those range, we email them a notice to file within 30 days. Now, just keep in mind, uh, because sometimes this gets confusing for folks, we use an automated email delivery system for these automated notices. It's jcope at public.govdelivery.com. That is a um, send-only email service. We can't accept re replies back to that, uh, to that email address. But that is the address that you should uh, submit to your agency's IT to make sure that there isn't any kind of block or spam filter uh, put that address on your safe senders list so that, um, so that your employees will receive these notices from JCO. All right, more important deadlines. Um, due dates for filers, I've already mentioned this though, um, for either filing or for requesting an exemption or for requesting extension, those due dates are the same for the two categories of people. So May 15th or November 15th, or within 30 days. All right. So remember, uh, just keep in mind that handout that we gave you uh, contains all of these dates. Uh, it can be confusing because I'm dealing with two different populations of people. And if you're, if you're only dealing with academic filers uh, or, uh, or non-academic filers, bouncing those two dates might confuse you. So look at the handout. That will help guide you. Now, the law requires agencies to notify us of any changes to file or information within 30 days. So uh, if, if, if you're new to this role, if you're a new ethics officer or trying to build up your, um, your compliance program, uh, one of the best practices that we can recommend is to establish good working relationships with human resources. because. If you're an ethics officer who is an attorney and maybe you know working in guidance for your agency, you may not have access to salary information or for job title designations, but it really is necessary. So uh, it's it's a good practice to uh, reach out to HR, explain what these requirements are, and to open up clear lines of communication so that when you have new staff who are hired or promoted or move into job titles that are policy-making positions, that they communicate that to you so that you can meet the 30-day uh, time frame for notifying us of those changes. So more best practices. Um, we do recommend that if, if you are notifying your staff of filing requirements or deadlines or training requirements, 
don't send just like a blanket email to all staff. Uh, I know a lot of us have an all staff option for sending emails, and that can be tempting, but all of your employees who are not FDS filers are going to get way confused, and, and that is not going to be helpful to your inbox. But I'll show you, uh, when we go through the, the, system, uh, the system training, I'll show you a couple of reports and places that will allow you to create a distribution list, an email list, that targets just your active filers or specific groups of people who are due for training. So there are ways that the system can really work with you and give you the resources to be able to manage this. So just to make sure that you're the first point of contact for filers about this stuff because um, when an email comes from Jcope from the first time, if they've never heard of the fact that they're an FDS filer, sometimes they just think it's spam or they ignore us, and, um, and that just creates some hard feelings on their part when they find out that they have to do this. So. <clears throat> now, there are a couple of groups. Uh, there's, there's, there are some people that kind of fall outside of the mainstream category, and one group of people are uh, members of boards commissions, authorities, uh, those kinds of folks. Um, sometimes they file, you know, these are people who are appointed to serve on various boards or commissions or authorities, right? So sometimes they are filing their FDS form directly with the appointments office. And if they do so, that's okay. They just provide a copy to JCOPE and that we update their records that way. There are also a small group of people who file uh, conflict of interest forms with the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. And those forms uh, will also meet the filing requirement as long as uh, they provide us with some supplemental information. So if you do have, uh, if you find yourself with some filers at your agency that fall into this category and you're unclear about their forms or how they file, give us a call. Um, there's, there's a lot to manage and there's a lot of questions, but honestly, we're all in this together. The laws are what they are, but we are here as a resource to really help guide, guide you on helping to manage all of this. So give us a call. We'll help you work through that. So let's talk about some frequently asked questions about the FDS system. So this is where I'll invite you to start uh, considering questions um, and Typing them in advance. Let me. Uh, I'm just adjusting my adjusting my chat window so I can make sure that I can see what you're talking about. Um, I did see somebody ask a question. Will this presentation be provided to the attendees? What we usually do is we just uh, we post the um, uh, the recording on our website with the handouts and supplemental information. So if you have questions about this, we will give you resources. All right. So FAQs. When you are creating a new profile for an FDS filer, you have to, uh, you have to provide a, an ID for the filer, an ny.gov ID that will allow the filer to enter and have access to the FDS system. Now, how a filer gets an ny.gov account depends in part on where they work. Many state agencies have the ability to create directory, New York.gov directory services accounts for their employees. So this is an agency function. Uh, if you don't know whether your agency does this or not, check with your HR. They usually do that as part of onboarding, and that becomes part of their employee ID. Not all agencies do have that ability, however, uh, particularly some smaller agencies or uh, those authorities, commissions, and boards. So if your agency does not automatically assign an ny.gov employee access account, then no problem, but the employee then just needs to create a personal ny.gov account. It's very simple. You go to the ny.gov, you click create a new account, you fill in some information, and you get assigned an ny.gov ID. So your, your employees would then have to provide that ny.gov ID to you so that you can add it to their profile. They won't be able to access the FDS system until they have that ny.gov ID associated with their profile. So SUNY employees have a slightly different uh, kind of access. They have a SUNY ID, and it's, it's the ID code that starts with S-U-N-Y. 
CUNY doesn't have that, though. So um, for SUNY employees, use your SUNY ID. For CUNY employees and all others, they have to just create a personal NY.gov account and then give it to you. So that's the important first step is that all FDS filers will need to have that NY.gov account to get access to the system. All right. Now you will also have to designate the filer. What kind of FDS filer are they? And there are a number of different categories, so I'll run through them. As I said before, most of your filers are going to be either policymakers or threshold filers. So a policymaker is, is in a job title that your agency has designated as a policymaking position. Or the threshold filers, those are the folks whose salary exceeds the salary threshold. Now, there is a designation called Ethics Denied, um, and that meant that JCOP had determined that a title is not eligible for an exemption. So somebody had asked, we said no, that's the designation. However, now that we have completed that title exemption review project that was multi years in the making, now that we're done reviewing all of those title exemptions, this Ethics Denied category is now considered obsolete and it's going to be phased out. So. Don't use ethics denied anymore. There's also a designation called agency objections, and that is uh, in the uncommon event that an agency has objected to an individual receiving an exemption. So if, if you think you might be in that circumstance, uh, go ahead and reach out to the FDS unit. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this one is not used very often. Now, there is a couple of former designations. So former threshold filer means that they used to be a filer because their threshold used to be above that, their salary used to be above the threshold, but now their salary has gone below the salary threshold for a number of reasons. So now they're no longer a filer. So if you change their designation to former threshold over, then that inactivates their profile. They're not a filer anymore. Same thing with former policymaker, right? Makes sense. Uh, if, the, if some circumstance has changed and the filer is no longer considered a policymaker, you change the designation to former policymaker. And as long as their salary is still below the threshold, then they would become inactive and exempt. If they're a former policymaker but their salary does exceed the threshold, then they get changed from policymaker to threshold filer. They're still a filer, it's just that the reason why they're a filer will change. See how that works? All right. Um, academic filer, these are our SUNY and CUNY professors. So it's a pretty limited group of people, but it does come with that whole separate set of deadlines because of who they are. And a former academic filer, uh, academic filers are not policymakers. They're professors. So they're kind of by definition, they're only there because they're threshold filers. So the former academic filer designation is it's a SUNY or CUNY professor who experiences a change of circumstance and now their salary is below the threshold and that makes them uh, inactive as well. So those, those are the main ones. So with this ethics denied designation, um, like, like I said, we are now phasing out that particular job uh, or that, that title designation. So if you are going through your filer certification list right now, right, if you're getting ready to certify that list by the end of uh, February, so you're going through every filer and checking on uh, to make sure that all of the information is accurate. If you see any filer that has the ethics denied uh, designation, please change that filer designation to either policymaker or threshold filer, depending on which one applies to them. Um, and I just want to say something else, just because I noticed it, and by this point, maybe somebody else has noticed it too. I'm a former English teacher, so these things sometimes bother me. If you see policymaker here in quotes with two words, that's because that is the way it got coded into the FDS system. But I am aware that policymaker is actually one word, but it's kind of just a legacy of the developers when they were building the system. So. I'm using policymaker because that is how it matches the system, but really technically, if you're the kind of person who really cares about language, policymaker is one word. So just saying. That was for you, Mr. St. John. <laughs> All right. 
Um, how should we handle filers who were above the old filing threshold but are now below the new filing threshold? This is a question that gets, that gets asked every year when the filing threshold changes. So right now you may not see too many people in this particular set of circumstances. Um, because the, 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 thre the threshold hasn't changed yet. When CSEA negotiates the new contract, it may. So if you have a policymaker whose salary is 101.379 or below, that's the current threshold. So if it's at that threshold or below, you can change them to former threshold over. So if some circumstance changed. And that in inactivates their profile and they don't have to file. They don't have to take training. Um, like I said, when CSEA negotiates its new salary schedule and we find out what the new one is, we will communicate that to you and give you guidance about what impact that may have on filers whose salary is now in kind of that gray area. All right. This is a common question that we get quite a bit. Um, how do we delete records of employees who have retired or otherwise permanently left? Um, well, first of all, we have mandatory records retention policies, so you're not allowed to delete records. We have to hang on to them uh, for seven years. So, but what you can do is you can change the filer's profile to make them inactive or exempt, and that will make them drop off of your active filer list. So that's really how it goes. And the way you do it is you edit the, um, the job information portion of a filer's profile. And I'll show you that when we get to that. But you, there's a little pencil icon that allows you to edit it. Uh, there's a job status box. And you can select left service retired, enter the effective date, update, and they go away. So they drop off your list. Now, we did get a question in advance from somebody who's joining us today. And they had kind of a related question to this. And they, they said, if somebody has an official retirement date, but they plan to actually leave earlier because they have a bucket of accrued time that they're planning on uh, using in advance of their retirement date, which date do you enter for this? And the answer is, use the last date that they were actually in the office. So their retirement party. Because what we're really, uh, what we're really interested in is uh, people who are still performing their job duties. So if they leave two months early, they're not performing their job duties, and, and that's okay. So you can use the last date that they're actually in the office. Um, they're just running down the clock, so that will be sufficient for you. All right? Uh, how do I indicate if one of my filers goes on leave? Um, first of all, I'll say this is this is an important reason why you should have uh, clear, open lines of communication with your HR department because we really do need to know when filers are on leave. Uh, you can update their job status to indicate that they're on leave, again, on the filer's profile, and give a date that they go on leave. That will make their profile temporarily inactive and will suspend any of our um, any of our notifications or training activities and things like that for that filer while they're on leave. But it's important that you then update them when they return from leave. And that's sometimes where uh, you have to really be diligent on making sure that we follow up. Sometimes people don't come back when they think they're going to, um, but it's important to develop some sort of tracking system to make sure that you are updating filers on that. Um, when a filer comes back from leave, uh, things like training due dates will automatically update based on the time frame that they were gone. So it's important that you do those updates when filers go on leave. Now, collective bargaining units can make requests for exemptions on behalf of members. Um, I don't know if this happens a lot, but it did happen uh, just this past year when we were doing the title exemption review process. So. Basically, it works the same as if a, a filer or an ethics officer wants to request an exemption. Uh, there are uh, individuals can make those exemption requests 
from their profile, but Essex officers and unions can use the, the form that's downloadable from our website. You provide the information and your rationale for requesting the exemption and submit it to JCO for review. Just keep in mind that this is only available for threshold filers. Sorry, all policymakers have to file, without exception. Now, how are these exemptions determined? Um, well, they are honestly looked at very carefully on an individual basis, and the, the individual's uh, job title, position, and duties are compared against the, the public's interest. So um, as long as it doesn't involve some really key uh, agency functions, like um, contracts, leases, properties, goods, grants of money or loans uh, related to regulations or rules, those are the kinds of things that are unlikely to have an exemption granted. But uh, sometimes people are in roles that do not involve those kinds of things, and uh, is, those are the kinds of positions where there might be a possibility for getting an exemption. So everyone is looked at uh, individually on a case-by-case -case basis. How do we notify uh, agencies about those determinations? Well, we review and process the request, but then we will send the filer an email uh, with the determination, and uh, ethics officers are CC'd in on that email determination. You can also tell, because once the determination is made, you can check the filer's profile, and you can see whether an exemption has been granted or not. So, but we do send emails and, uh, to both the filer and the ethics officer about that. Okay, um, how is notification made when an employee's exempt or non-exempt status is, is changed? Who's notified it? No, notified it? Ooh, notified. Um, well, first of all, one of the best ways to find out what's going on with a filer is to just go straight to the filer's profile and take a look. Uh, we do try to make sure that all the information that's important to you is right there. So anytime there's a change to the filer status, uh, the profile, uh, it, it'll appear immediately on the profile. Um, but we will send the filer an email notice that uh, they're now required to file an FDS, and those emails are generally CC'd to FX officers as well. Now, uh, we get this question quite a bit. What happens if those filers don't file on time? Well, just like for agencies, submitting your certification list is probably the most critical task you can perform. For filers, actually submitting the financial disclosure form is the most critical task that they have. These are important legal obligations, and so the law sets out a series of actions for what happens when filers don't file. So the first thing that happens is we'll reach out to you as the agency just to make sure that, like, are they still a filer? Maybe they didn't file because they actually retired and their profile just hasn't been updated yet, right? So we'll check with you first just to make sure that, like, are they really there? Um, but then we'll send the filer a what we call a 15-day letter. And that gives them 15 days to either comply or correct the filing, depending, because sometimes people just like forget a question or don't answer things as thoroughly as they need to. So this 15-day letter is, is their opportunity to fix whatever was deficient. Now, if 15 days goes by and they fail to remedy whatever the issue was, then Jacob will send both the filer and the agency a notice of delinquency. And the notice of delinquency will advise the filer of the consequences of noncompliance, but notices of delinquency are also made public. They are posted to JCOPE's website. So that, um, that, that is also uh, an outcome that I would suggest that filers probably want to avoid because, you know, once your name gets posted on the Internet, uh, especially associated with an ethics lapse, uh, you know, Google is forever. There are financial penalties for failure to file. Uh, they can be significant, up to $40,000 civil penalty. Uh, there's also a possibility for criminal prosecution. Um, but even if those worst case scenarios happened, that still doesn't get them out of the filing requirement. They could get fined and they still have to file. So um, if you have a filer who is having difficulty or expressing some problems with getting their filing in on time, have them call our filing specialist. Uh, we've got a small group of 
really knowledgeable, friendly people who will walk a filer through and answer their questions and, and help them meet this requirement. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to help them with this, but they have to, uh, they, filing is definitely required. It's not optional for them. Now, sometimes ethics officers get uh, a bunch of questions from their filers about how to answer specific questions on the form. So first of all, know that we have, uh, we, every year we produce a detailed filing guide for all of the questions on that year's form. And we do it annually because sometimes from year to year the, the, the questions may change a little bit. So every year we, perform, we, we provide a detailed guide to every single question on there. Right? But most of the questions are, um, are, are accessible. It, you know, the, the important thing is when it comes to retirements, or trusts, or estates, um, this doesn't include um, your, your state pension, but it would include like your deferred compensation, or if you have a, an outside 401k, anything else like that. Uh, trusts and estates, of course, would also be included in that. Uh, for income, it's not just the employee's state income. Income includes all forms of income that the employee may receive. And remember, this is uh, all designed to help prevent conflicts of interest. So if an employee is earning uh, outside income, uh, it has to be checked to make sure that there isn't a conflict of interest between their outside activities and performing their public duties. So that's why that question's on there. And that's the same reason why they get asked about investments and real estate as well, is because, again, this is all about transparency and making sure that there aren't any conflicts of interest for these employees in their conduct of their state business. Right? But if you, have, um, if you have any questions about this or just refer, refer your filers to the, the filing unit, I can say, though, that uh, as we get into the filing month, right before the deadline, uh, our small, small group of filing specialists do get overwhelmed with questions. So uh, the more you can help us out by fielding um, you know, some of those smaller questions, uh, the faster your filers will be able to get answers. Okay, that is, uh, that is the last bit of the FAQ. So, did I cover all of your FDS questions? Did, uh, is there any still kind of pending? Just kind of vamping on the piano right now, waiting to see if I see any other questions coming up in the text chat area. Um, the, other thing, the other thing I'll say, though, is the Q&A function, um, don't put questions in Q&A function because I'm not monitoring that during the training. The Q&A function is, put questions that are really kind of more specific to your agency and you really kind of want a personalized answer. And so if you put any questions in Q&A, those will get reviewed and answered via email after the training is over. But the text chat area is where you can just kind of um, uh, respond, react, and ask questions uh, that I might be able to answer during the quick, uh, question. So uh, we got a question here, if an employee has an outside IRA, do they have to list the stocks individually? Um, I would refer that question to Melinda if she has a, a, a quick answer. Actually, as a matter of fact, Melinda, why don't you say hello before we move away from financial disclosure, just so that folks can uh, hear your voice and, and see you. See if Melinda's there. Is Melinda there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Melinda Funk, the Deputy Director of the FDS Unit. She is, uh, she is in charge of filing specialists. We're here to answer your questions. Do you have a, do you have an answer to the IRA? I am just double checking. I want to make sure I give the right information. So the IRA as a whole would be reported in question number 11 on the financial disclosure statement. Um, see. I'm just double checking question number 16. Some retirement plans require you to break down the information within it. Excuse me about my cat. I realize that. Um, I got here and you were gone. Okay, 
well, um, you can follow up, follow up with that question and get a more specific answer for it. But this is the kind of thing where this is why sometimes you need a filing specialist because um, – I just couldn't understand how you can leave, but I, I, I get it. Yeah, no, you would not need to list the individual funds within an IRA. I'm so sorry. You would just uh, list the IRA as a whole in question number 11. Uh, here's, here's another question for you, Melinda. If an employee is on leave of absence during the filing deadline, say May 15th, do they get a new deadline? What happens? What happens yes, it – Yes, if somebody is out on a leave, for example, they're out on FMLA or a military leave that begins April 1st, and they're scheduled to return back to work on July 1st, the system should be updated to reflect that leave, and then once the filer returns, you should go back in, update the account, the system will send a new 30-day filing notice to the filer, so they will get an additional time period. Well, there we go, and thank you for your chat. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on now into covering uh, the, the training part of the FDS system and what are key tasks there. So just know that the ethics training requirement is attached to the filing requirement. So if you, as, as long as you are required to file an FDS, you are required to take training. There is no exemption from the training requirement. Um, but if you are exempt from filing, the training goes away. But those two things are connected. As long as you're a filer, you have to take training. So uh, it's according to Executive Law 94, um, and uh, Executive Law 94 also says that training has to be live, and that's why um, that's why we can't package up a uh, a course a self-directed learning course and post it online for people to take on their own time. Uh, that's, that's why we require ethics officers to provide ethics training is because of this live requirement in Executive Law 94. It places limits on us, right? We have to make sure that we meet this somehow. So there are uh, there's a couple of different training classes. The first one is the online ethics orientation, the OEO. This is designed for brand new filers who who come on board for the first time. Now, uh, the, a filer's primary training requirement is the Comprehensive Ethics Training Course, the CETC. That is comprehensive. It's the big live two-hour class that covers all of the various information that new filers need to know about their obligations under the public officer's law. Right? But a new filer has up to two years to get themselves into one of those classes. And we don't want somebody in policy making or high ranking positions for two years and be unaware of the ethics laws. So that's the point of the orientation. The orientation is really kind of like a, a placeholder class while they're waiting to get seated for a CETC. Now currently the ethics orientation class comprises of a 40 minute video of me uh, conducting uh, an overview of the major aspects of the public officer's law. And during that 40-minute video, I provide them instructions on how to find and download an affirmation form that they sign and give to the ethics officer that affirms that, yes, they have spent 40 minutes and watched this video. All right? So again, this is the, the OEO is mainly just kind of a placeholder training while they're waiting to get seated for the CETC. Now, if a filer gets into a CETC class right away, then that's great. I mean, the sooner the better, honestly, because it's, it really gives them the most information. So if they take the CETC first before taking the orientation, then entering a completion date for the CETC will automatically test them out of the OEO. They don't need to go back and take the orientation if they've already taken the CETC. So that's how that works. Now, after they complete that CETC for the first time, all filers have to take the CETC at least once that first time. But after they take that, then they're subject to refresher training every three years thereafter. Now, when their three years comes due and they're ready for refresher training, they can either retake the CETC, and most agencies offer the CETC kind of on an ongoing basis, so 
you can shove all of your folks into a CETC class, and that'll be good for first-time new filers, as well as those who need refresher training. You're good. But there is also a second class called the Ethics Seminar that is designed specifically for refresher training. It's a little bit shorter. It's a little bit more interactive. Um, so as an ethics officer, you have the choice. You, can, uh, you should be offering the CETC on an ongoing basis. But if you wish, you can also offer the Ethics Seminar course as a refresher option for those filers who are in need of refresher training. Many, uh, many agencies honestly only host the CETC because that covers both new people and uh, returning users, uh, but it's up to you. There is that second course. But just keep in mind that um, all future uh, completions of the CETC get marked as refresher training. Um, only the first time somebody takes the CETC is it marked as a CETC date. I'll show you that a little bit more. Uh, I'll show you what I mean as we get into it. Now, we are required to keep track of training statistics and report them annually to the governor's office. We are in annual report statistics time uh, as we speak right now. So we do depend on the regular updates that you make to a filer's training history in order to compile those, uh, those statistics. So uh, we used to require agencies to submit an annual report to us that detailed all of your filers' training history for the past year. But now that we've moved all of the training uh, history into the FDS system, that annual report is not necessary. You're welcome. That was a beast, and we took that off of your plate. <laughs> so just do your updates on a regular basis, and you're good to go. So let's talk about some of the key tasks uh, that relate to uh, ethics officers. Now, when a new filer account is created in the system, the first thing that happens is that the filer will get an, a training email. It's the new filer training email that says, hey, new filer, here's your training obligations, so that they can get started on trying to get seated for a class. But that's why it's really important for you to notify your filer in advance that they're going to be subject to these filing and training rules, because otherwise, the first thing they'll ever hear about it is this training notice. And that's why a lot of people just kind of roll their eyes and go, what's this? Right? So it's important that you reach out and notify your filers before you create those profiles. Uh, so communication with your filers is really important, uh, both communicating their filing status. Uh, other required actions are to deliver the, the training yourself. Well, I should, I should change that. As the ethics officer, your agency has to offer this training to filers. Um, on an ongoing basis. How you do that uh, it has, it has lots of room for you to, to figure out the best way according to your agency's needs and resources. First of all, you can delegate the training to somebody else in your agency. And that person does not necessarily need to be specifically knowledgeable about the public officer's law. We do provide a complete set of trainer notes with all the information needed, and questions can be deferred back to the JCOPE attorneys. But uh, we do utterly depend on ethics officers to be the, the primary source of ethics training. We also need ethics officers to monitor the training compliance status of your filers, uh, notify them of upcoming due dates, notify them of upcoming training opportunities at your campus, and update your filers' training status with completion dates as they take training. So, that sounds like a lot, but that's one of the reasons why ethics officers can delegate tasks to agency contacts who do a lot of the, the routine uh, data entry and um, data management functions for your filers. So let's talk about your frequently asked questions. So uh, sometimes when you're entering a date, uh, some, some folks get confused as to which course should be indicated as completing uh, that refresher training. So I mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll really this, this is an important consideration. Much confusion can be avoided if you know how the FDS system considers these courses. So whenever you see CETC in the FDS system, what the system means is the first time a filer completes the CETC. And that's because there is a legal requirement that all filers take this class at least once. So that first time training completion date is recorded separately from all future refresher training dates. 
So if you have somebody who is taking refresher training, when you enter that refresher training date, there will be a drop-down box that asks you, okay, they took refresher training, but which course? Did they take it as the CETC or did they take it as the ethics seminar? So you will be given an opportunity to specify which course a filer took, at least for the for refresher training. But that first time CETC is recorded separately. I'll show you that when we get to those system files. All right, so I mentioned this already. What does tested out mean for the OEO? Uh, super simple. It just means that somebody took the CETC before the OEO and that tested them out of the requirement. That's, that's all that means. If you do happen to see uh, a February 23rd, 2017 date for an OEO class that you know somebody didn't take, that was just um, on that date uh, the, the system developers kind of cleaned up a whole bunch of empty records and tested out uh, a whole group of filers that have previously completed the CETC. So uh, if you ever have questions about um, a, a question or a date uh, that you see on a filer's profile, um, reach out to me. I'll look into it. I'll see if I can help. All right. There is one section of the FDS system that is called the Filer Training Data Entry section, and that is where all of your uh, your filer's training history lives. So all of your filers who are active for your agency, active non-exempt filers who, who belong to you, your agency as your primary agency should appear on those lists. So if you have filers that are not appearing on your training list, either their profile is inactive or exempt, or you have a filer who has who, who is affiliated with two different agencies and your agency is the secondary agency. They'll only appear on the training list of the primary agency who has responsibility for training them. The third reason why they might not appear on those lists are if, um, if um, there's some problem on the filer's profile. And that happens. Uh, this, <laughs> this system has been in place for at least four years now. It is still under development. We still have the development team constantly making improvements and updates. There have definitely been some system glitches that we've had to track down and fix. And so there are definitely filers' profiles that still have some legacy errors that just never got caught, and we just fix them as we find them. So, uh, so sometimes it's a, just a, uh, an error, a data error on the filers' profile. So. You can always reach out to the education team for help troubleshooting any of those kinds of problems. Um, I see a question. Uh, somebody asked, do, do the trainers that get delegated need to be attorneys? No, they don't. Um, we, we, don't uh, we, we try not to shackle you with too many requirements on this. Uh, it is better if the trainer is the ethics officer or an attorney just because um, those, those folks usually have a good working knowledge of any additional agency level ethics policies that may apply to, uh, to your filers. So we think that that is a, a best case scenario, but it doesn't have to be. Some agencies have, have professional development teams and they have trainers on staff that do regular professional development. Um, sometimes it's somebody in human resources who takes on the, the training role, and that's fine. Uh, they don't need to be specifically knowledgeable. Like I said, I provide trainer notes. And if you have, if you delegate training to somebody who's feeling a little bit nervous about training it for the first time, have them reach out to me. I train this stuff all the time, and I would be happy to answer questions, walk them through it, uh, give them some tips and pointers. Uh, we're, we're, we're all in this together to try to get all these folks trained under this live requirement. So uh, reach out. We'll, we'll try to help you as much as we can. All right? Don't be scared of doing the training. It really is, it's fairly harmless. It's, you know, maybe not the most interesting top topic you've ever trained before, um, but we try to make the, the materials user-friendly for both the trainer and for the participants. All right, uh, filers can request a training extension. Um, sometimes things happen, they can't get their training done on time. Um, so training extensions, though, uh, ethics officers can't request it on behalf of filers mainly because the mechanism for granting a training extension is triggered from a filer's profile, and ethics officers can't get there. So filers, instruct your filers to log into their profile, and I'll show you when we get to the screenshots, there is a big button called Training Extension Request, 
you know, right in the center of a filer's profile. So they can request an extension, and that gives them a 60-day uh, extension of their training due date. And it can be um, it can be extended by an additional 60 days if necessary. Um, we'll send you an email letting you know of those training determinations. We usually try to be really liberal with granting extensions. Uh, they you know give us some reason. We'll probably you know be willing to give you an extension on that. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind: when a filer is past due on a training due date, they start receiving monthly late training reminder notices. They're automated notices from the system. And uh, uh, this sometimes starts making filers get very nervous. We know from, from past history that nobody likes getting naughty notes from the ethics agency. And they're not meant to be naughty notes. They're just meant to be reminders. When training happens every three years, this slips the minds of anybody. So we just remind them, but people get very upset. So uh, if you have a filer who reaches out to you saying, uh, I just got this note, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble, I missed training, you can reassure them. Um, there are no civil penalties associated with miss missing a training deadline. It is a legal requirement, but they're, they're, not, going to, they're not going to be penalized uh, for missing this training deadline. We just want to help them meet this requirement, and uh, we appreciate your help with that. All right, what happens to a father's training history if they're either on leave, if they were, or their profile was inactive or exempt for some reason, but then they come back. These are what we call reactivated profiles, right? Their profile was inactive when they're on leave or exempt or inactive, but if they come back or some status changes and now they're an active profile again, their profile is reactivated. And what happens to their training date depends on how long they were on leave or they were, they were gone. So if they were, if they were gone for less than one year before they come back, then what should happen is that any outstanding due date simply gets extended by the amount of time that they were on leave or exempt or inactive. All right. However, if they were gone for more than one year, then when their profile is reactivated, what happens is their training history gets archived and they get treated as a new filer for the purposes of training. So they get a brand new orientation class and a brand new first time CETC class added to their profile. And the thinking there is that if you have somebody who's gone for more than a year, it's possible that they may have missed any kind of important uh, updates or changes to the public officer's law or ethics policies. So we want to really make sure that when they come back after an extended absence, they get the full training so that they can be refreshed on all of the various uh, aspects of the public officer's law that may apply to them. Oh, and, but I should say, we had, um, I'm just going to back up for a second. Oops, wrong, wrong way. There we go. Um, one thing I'll say about this, though, is in the past year or so, we have had a real dickens of a time uh, getting these reactivation rules correct. I, I've been working very closely with the FDS system developers. Uh, there were a number of different uh, glitches that were preventing what should happen with their dates from actually happening accurately. So if you in the past had a reactivated filer and you notice their training due dates do not seem to be right, um, it's very possible that they're just still part of the, the data that we haven't found and fixed yet. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. I can help uh, troubleshoot and figure out what it should be. Um, but we think that it's fixed now. So that's what should happen. All right, um, so what are some other reasons why filers may have incorrect training due dates? Well, uh, like I said, as a consequence of um, all of those prior system bugs, uh, we find them as we can, we try to fix the profiles that we can, but there are, uh, we know that there are a lot of legacy issues that just need to be uh, fixed as we find them. So most date errors, most errors can be fixed using the training override tool that you find directly on a filer's profile. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, when, we, when we get to the system stuff. But uh, the training override is exactly for that. It's for overriding problems. It's for fixing errors. It's not for entering new information, but if you find problems in a filer's training history, the training override is where you can, uh, is the tools that will help you fix it. Or reach out to me and I can either walk you through how to fix it or I can show you how to use it or I can um, help you make those changes. 
Okay, uh, questions about ethics training um, before I move into our quick orientation. Um, a question here, uh, is the CETC due two years after the profile creation or two years after the OEO completion? That is a great question. Thank you for asking that. It's two years after profile creation. So those two due dates run concurrently, right? So the OEO, they've got 90 days to complete the OEO, and simultaneously they have two years to complete the CETC. So um, the, do, the two years does not start from the date they complete the OEO. It's from the date they became a filer. Thank you for asking that. Okay, um, if you have any other questions about training, drop them in the text chat. Meanwhile, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move into our overview. And the graphic that you see right here just shows you the, uh, the menus options that are available to FDS officers in the system. Now, there are a couple of uh, known things. You may, every once in a while, get an err, one, two, three message, error. And we know a couple of things trigger that. In order to update a filer's profile, you have to hit two update buttons, and sometimes that gets forgotten. So that could sometimes trigger an error message. Or there could just legitimately be a system issue. So try your update again. If you still get that message, reach out to us and find out whether or not the system is down. Uh, it doesn't go down often, but it does every once in a while, and that's kind of usually circumstances outside of our control. Um, but the other issue is browser compatibility. Um, sometimes some people seem to have issues with one browser or another. I did just reach out to our system developers to, uh, to get updated information, and they say that ITS tries to stay compatible with the current version of all major browsers and two releases prior to that. So if you think that it might be a browser compatibility issue, um, we suggest that Make sure that your browser is updated to the most late, latest version, or try switching a browser to see if that has any kind of impact, because sometimes it does. I usually access the FDS system using both the Chrome browser and that new Microsoft Edge browser, and I haven't had any problems, but every once in a while we hear of reports that people have a little bit of issue, so check your browser settings. All right, so you log in uh, to your ethics officer dashboard, and the first thing you'll get is a, um, it's a dialog box, and you just have to click OK in order to continue, but this meets the legal standard because, as I said, you have to certify your list once a year and make any updates to that list within 30 days of any change to filers. So this dialog box just says, yep, I recognize that any updates to my filers is an official amendment to that certification list. Okay, so you just click OK and move on. Um, so your dashboard will be the place where you, uh, where you start. Now we start with the search menu. Um, this allows you to quickly search for an individual filer within your agency. And of course there's advanced functions to allow you to search by all sorts of different parameters. Um, the search function is only available for those FDS officers. If you're, if you're logged in as a filer, you won't be able to search anybody else. But for FDS officers, you need to be able to find your filers, and the search box is how you do it, as you would think. That one's pretty standard. So let's say we've used the search to go to a filer's profile. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what you might see there. The filer's profile is where you can uh, make changes, right? And you're going to be reviewing your list right now uh, during this month, most likely. So this is where you would change. If you have any, uh, any changes to the filer's contact information, you can see the arrow there is pointed to these little tiny pencils. If you, have, if you have aging eyes, you have to look closely for those little pencils, but the pencil icon allows you to edit all of the fields within the filer information. Now over to the other side of the screen, on the right side, is the agency information. And there's a little pencil there as well. Uh, you can see the red arrow is pointing to that pencil. And that allows you to edit all of the information, the, the job information for the agency, including that really important job status box. That's where you indicate when somebody retires, leaves service, goes on leave, et cetera. All right? But this is also where if they change their job title or salary or designation changes, you make those changes on the agency side. 
Now, once you've made your changes, this is where you have to you have to update in two different spots. So the first update is at the end of the agency box. You update that to accept changes there, and then when all profile uh, when you're when you're satisfied that all profile changes have been made, in the lower left hand corner, that is the second master update the filer file. So. Um, I've got a question about Excelsior Fellows working for the Chamber, um, and which agency do those fellows um, go on? That's a question to put in the Q&A so we can ask you more about it and, and get you a right answer for it. So record that there so I don't miss you. Okay, so filer's profile. Um, when you look at a filer's profile, it's broken up into a number of different panels that have different information. The first panel is the filer's uh, personal info history, and this section just lists any changes that were made to a filer's profile information. So if they moved and you changed their address, um, it will be recorded here that a change was made to their address. All right, so that's, that, that one's pretty straightforward. Below that section is the activity log. This can be a very busy place, especially for filers who've been around for a long time or have had a lot of different uh, changes to their profile. So since the activity log, the, the activity log lists all the activities associated with the filer's account. So since it can get quite lengthy and cumbersome, right at the top of the activity log, there is a series of filters that you can use to kind of filter it out. If you're only looking for training information, for example, you can click the education filter and only the relevant training information will appear in the activity log. That's really useful. I use that all the time. Now, also in the activity log, it, as related to training, this is where, in the activity log, you can enter a new training completion date for an individual filer. So if you had one particular filer who completed the OEO and they let you know, uh, you, you just go to the filer's profile, filter the activity log, and look for the little pencil icon next to an open due date. Any open class. That, that needs to be completed will have the due date and then the pencil. You click the pencil and it'll allow you to enter the completion date right there. Now, at the bottom of the activity log, there's a comment box. You can also use that to add comments to the activity log, but please note, those comments are not forwarded on to the FDS or education units. Um, nobody will see them unless they happen to be looking at the filer's profile. So, this is not the way to communicate changes to us if, if we need to be notified of something. But if you need to make some sort of change to the filer's pro profile, this is more like note to self, um, that this is what I changed, this is why I changed it. Um, I use that comment box a lot. If I, have to, if I have to correct a person's training due dates because of some system glitch, I'll write an explanation in the uh, activity log so that I can remember what I did and why. So that's what that comment's about. Now here's the training override tool. It's right there in the activity log. It's at the end of the row of filter buttons. And this is where you can fix errors. That's what it's for. Um, you're gonna make errors, the system will make errors, but you know we're all subject to typos. If you're entering a training completion date and you fat fingered the keyboard and, you have, and then you hit enter and whoops, you, you put in the wrong date, that's what the training override is for. It's, it allows you to fix problems that you find. Please note, though, it is not for entering new things. So don't try to add a new training completion date and override a previous training completion date. I mean, it'll let you do that, but now you're screwing up their training history, so don't do that. Um, so you just use the pencil icon to edit the fields that you need to. Uh, the training override also allows you to add a class if, there's miss if a class is missing. And there's a button there that's called Send Schedule. So if you needed to correct a due date, you can hit the send schedule button and that will send the filer an updated schedule with correct due dates. So you make your changes, you hit the update button and that's good. If you have any questions about how to use that training override function, give me a call. Uh, we give you great power with this, with this tool to change all sorts of things. Uh, just make sure you use it wisely, okay? And I'm always happy to look into things and help out if you have any questions about that. Now, the filers dashboard, this is just a quick look at the filers dashboard to show you some things that are available to the filer that are not available to uh, FDS officers. So 
So the first thing is filers have a help button in the upper right-hand corner that allows them to send a direct email to ethics officers, FDS, uh, the FDS filing specialists, and to the education team. So that is a resource for them. Regardless of what questions they have, there's a means that they can get help right from their profile. But also towards the, the bottom of the screenshot, I have an arrow pointing to that training extension request button that appears on filers' profiles. So if somebody wants a training extension, direct them to log in, and that's where they find it. And then right at the, below that is all of the filing information. Uh, my screenshot cuts it off, but that's where you'll, they'll find the icons to be able to request uh, a filing extension or exemption. All right, next menu is the Add menu. Um, does two things. The first thing is it adds, it allows you to add a filer. This is where you do it. You click Add Filer. Or the officer, uh, this allows an ethics officer to add additional agency contacts to help them manage things. Um, somebody asked uh, how to log into the FDS system when you have dual roles as a filer and an ethics officer. I can't demo it because I, I'm just using static screenshots. But if you are an ethics officer, but you are also an FDS filer, when you log in, it's going to prompt you which role do you, uh, which, which, uh, which role do you want to log in under? And you select either um, officer or filer. So if you're filing your own form, you log in as a filer. If you're logged in to manage your agency's filers, log in as an officer. All right, um, adding filers uh, can be a process. So you add a filer, and what we want to do is make sure that there isn't already a profile in the system. Maybe they uh, used to be a filer for your agency but haven't been for a while, or maybe they're a filer in a different agency before they came there. So add the filer, and um, if there is a possible match, you'll get this pop-up box, and it allows you to review the information there. If it is a match, you click that little icon where I have the arrow, and that will merge their information, uh, what you just entered, with their former profile information, and that preserves their filing history and their training history. If, it's, if there's no match, then just click the Create New Filer, and there will be a brand new profile. If you accidentally create a duplicate profile for a filer, because uh, this isn't a perfect system, uh, just reach out to the FDS help desk because they have the ability to merge those duplicate profiles. What's the difference between an ethics officer and an agency contact? Uh, well, uh, both of them have full read-write permissions within the system. Uh, so agency contacts can be delegated to do all sorts of system updates, so they have to have access to all of the system information. There are multiple uh, you, you can have multiple ethics officers and multiple agency contacts. That is allowable, but it's a matter of who creates those roles. New ethics officers are created by JCOPE, the FDS unit. New agency contacts are created by the ethics officer. JCOPE has to delete both of those. So if you have an ethics officer or an agency contact who leaves or is no longer in that role, uh, reach out to the FDS unit, and they will remove that person's permissions. So uh, the only real difference um, between an ethics officer and an agency contact functionally that you'll notice is that an ethics officer can create new agency contacts, but agency contacts cannot create additional agency contacts. All right, that's, that's the main difference between them. Okay, now in the certification menu, the first uh, menu item is your filer certification list. This is where you actually do that big annual filer certification. This is the list that you certify. There are other reports that allow you to review the information before you certify, but this is the, this is the place where you do it. So you pull up your agency, you designate whether this is your academic or non-academic list, you review that list of filers and make sure everything is accurate, and when you are sure that it is all good, then in the lower left-hand corner, you click Certify Agency. Boom. That's it. That's your annual certification list. Of course, the, the real challenge is actually reviewing the list. Clicking the button is not the hard part. It's reviewing the list and making sure the data is updated. Now, the second uh, menu function there is Filer Training Data Entry. And I mentioned this before. 
this section it houses all of your filers training information there so some screens are more useful than others but uh, it's because this whole section was designed primarily to give you the means to do batch updates of large groups of people so if you held a training class and you have 30 people you want to be able to kind of enter all of those dates as a group instead of having to go to 30 different individual uh, profiles to update. So this is really designed to speed up your data entry with batch, with batch updates, but it also allows you to download information, training information for reporting purposes. So it defaults first to the all screen. Um, you see there's uh, radio buttons there, all online ethics orientation, CETC, seminar, and upcoming. And each one of those screens gives you different views. So it defaults to the all view. Um, it's really hard to give a complicated training history a snapshot view. So I honestly don't think that this view is very helpful. But what is helpful on this screen is that all of the names are hyperlinked. And so you can just click on a name and go directly to the filer's profile. So that can be a convenience if you need to make an update directly on the filer's profile. All column headings are sortable. So if you click a column heading, it will sort the whole table by that. So moving on to the OEO uh, screen view, this allows you to enter a completion date for uh, an individual filer or a group of filers if they all took the OEO on the same date, that's fine. So you'll see the list of names. Again, you can sort that list alphabetically by clicking the name column. You find your filers and you check the box in the left-hand column for the filer that you want to update. And then in the lower left-hand corner, you enter a training completion date and hit enter. Boom, it's as easy as that. You can also do this directly on the filer's profile though, but this is, uh, this is the second place that you can do that. Now on the CETC screen, this is for recording that first time training completion date for CETC. So if you host a CETC class and you have some brand new filers who are taking it for the first time, and you have filers who are taking it on repeat for refresher training, you'll have to separate those two groups of people because you'll only be able to put the new people on this particular page. Anybody who already has completed the CETC, that you won't be able to click their name. It, it won't uh, be an option for you. But here you select their names, you put in a completion date, and now there's a new option. This is CLE credit. Uh, some agencies are accredited by the New York State CLE Board to offer CLE credits for attorneys. CLE stands for Continuing Legal Education. Some agencies have this certification, many agencies don't. So if this, if this seems like strange information, probably it doesn't reply to you, and that's fine. Um, but for agencies who do offer CLE credits to their staff attorneys, this allows you a means of uh, keeping track of who got offered CLE credit. So you put the date, uh, it defaults to no CLE credit because uh, most agencies it just doesn't apply to. So skip it over if it doesn't and click enter. And that's, that's all it takes there. Now refresher training, the, the ethics seminar slash refresher training screen is where you're going to record all of the training for everybody who is taking it on an ongoing basis. Whether they took the CETC or the seminar class, everybody who's doing ongoing training gets recorded here. So you go to the screen view. You can select multiple people, but now your options change. Your class type box is now a drop-down box, and that's where you'll be able to say, okay, well, all these people took refresher training, but they took it as the CETC, or they took it as the ethics seminar class. So specify the class type and the completion date, CLE if that matters, and hit enter, and this is how you can update a whole group of people all at once. There is also an edit function right here on the screen. So if you do have a typo, if you just updated 35 people with the wrong date, you can edit it using this function as well. Now the upcoming, the last screen view, I think is the gift that keeps on giving. I love this screen view. I think this is most useful for ethics officers who are uh, trying to keep track and planning your ethics training program. This allows you to monitor both filers who, have, who are past due as well as filers who are coming due on their training due dates. So you click this view and click the due date column. That will sort your list according to due date. Anybody who's already passed due, their date will be in red, just as a quick visual. But then you'll be able to see who's coming due in the next 
you know, whatever span of time you want. You can download that into a spreadsheet. This screen view includes the filer's email address, so you can quickly assemble an invitation list. If you're hosting uh, some trainings, you, this is where you can get the group of people specific invitations to get them into the trainings that you offer. I think this is really helpful. I love this view, my favorite view. All right, um, the last option under the certification menu is training officers. Uh, this is just a, a kind of a minor function. By default, all ethics officers will receive training, uh, will get CC'd on training notices. So late notices and uh, training extension notices. Um, but you can delegate, uh, as an ethics officer, you can delegate who gets those training notices. So uh, you can toggle on or off who gets the training notices, either ethics officers or agency contacts. Uh, the only thing is, has to be at least one person from the agency who's getting those notices, but other than that, you can determine who that person is. Uh, we did just recently hear some, uh, from a couple of ethics officers that they seem to not be getting training notices in the last few months. We do have somebody uh, on the FDS team that is, or um, the developers who are looking into that. So uh, you should be getting those notices if you have that training indicator on. All right. Um, hang, hang with me, I am almost done. I know that we uh, were aiming to end by 2.30, but I'm really, really close. So thank you for being patient. If you have to go, um, I, I understand that, and this, this will be available if you need to catch up later. Okay, um, reports. You've got a couple of reports available. These are really useful also for uh, being able to review your active filer list, as well as to be able to download and create email distribution lists to communicate with your filers. So the first is the active inactive filers report. This allows you to either look for only your active filers or if you want to review a, a list of people who are considered inactive. Right? And you can see it gives you a variety of information. The next report is the agency report. It gives you uh, more expanded information about, the, uh, about your filers. So the, their name, email address, designation, job title, salary. So when you're reviewing your filer list, this can be a good uh, report to download in order to review that information for accuracy. The final report is the uh, ethics officer filer list. Honestly, I think this is a report that's still under development. It uh, currently gives you uh, a list of people whose profiles were updated within a certain date range. So it can be useful depending on what kinds of management tools that you want to use. The last menu item is the preference menu, and this is just cosmetic. Currently, all the preference menu does is allow you to change the color scheme, but it's kind of a placeholder menu for future system enhancements. So if you like to change colors, there you go. That's you. Okay, so here is our contact information. Um, all right, well, hang on a second. Let's question. Um, Somebody's asking, am I correct that only active filers will appear on the upcoming list? Correct. On those filer training data entry screens that allow you to, do, uh, to enter, only active non-exempt filers should appear on those active training lists. So um, if they're uh, on leave or exempt or inactive for some reason, they won't appear because they do not need to take training while they're on leave or inactive or exempt, so they won't appear on your list, or they shouldn't. If they do, give me a call. All right. So here's our contact information. Um, thank you, Camille. Um, you're, you're one of the people who, uh, who notified me that you're not getting those notices. So I do have a ticket in. I want to get that training indicator fixed because I want you to get the notices that, uh, that you need. So we're, we're working on it. Um, we're, I got the developers uh, working on why that's happening. I think it probably happened because we suspended notices over the summer, uh, you know, in, starting in the spring when lockdown first happened. We suspended the notices for uh, six months as everybody pivoted and adjusted to a, a new normal. Um, so when they turned them back on, I, th I think something went haywire and they're trying to track that down. So I, we're on it. We're on it. Be patient. Um, okay, so uh, somebody also asked whether we were going to post the PowerPoint materials themselves for reference. Uh, we had not intended to, but I will ask that question and we'll see if we can supply those materials. So give us about a week. Uh, it may actually take me a little bit longer to edit the video uh, to get it posted because I'm working from home and don't have the same tools. Um, 
but we will do what we can to get all of the materials from today's class posted to our website. We will be posting it in the Ethics Officer Info Center uh, portion of our website. If you haven't already discovered that, that is a landmine, a goldmine, sorry, goldmine of good information for ethics officers, including all of the training course materials uh, that you might need to, to do that. So since most of us are working from home still, the fastest way to reach us is via email. Um, but we can certainly arrange to have a, a phone conference with you if you need to have us talk you through or work with you on, on any kinds of problems that you have. So uh, if you have FDS, FDS questions, you need to reach out to Melinda and her team for anything. The FDS help desk is ethel at jcope.ny.gov. And no, there's nobody here by the name of Ethel, but that is the name of our help desk. There you go. Uh, if you have any questions about the training program, uh, how it works, functions, or operates, or if you have troubleshooting on filers training histories, you can reach out to us at education at jcope.ny.gov, and we'll get to you, all right? So with that said, thank you for your patience. I know I went 10 minutes uh, over, but um, I do talk a lot. So thank you all very much for joining us here today, and uh, your handouts you, should be helpful for you. We've given you a copy of the user guide to, to guide you, but other than that, reach out to us with your questions. We're here to help you. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a beautiful day.